So this is lecture 18 of ECE 2305. And so today's lecture, it's going to be a little intense. So we're going to first talk about the frame format of an 802.11 uh, frame. And then we'll talk about medium access control yet again. And what we're going to do is we're going to be introduced to the cousin of CSMA-CD, which is going to be CSMA-CA. OK, sounds very similar. But there's one notable exception, which we will look at kind of closely. But before that, we have to go through the you know, details, because the devil's always in the details with respect to the frame format of 802.11. OK. So all this stuff here, we have a variety of different bits of information that's contained in the frame. right? So we have everything from the frame control, which is the flag for every Mac frame that comes from an 802.11 device that says, what type of frame is this? Is this a management frame? Is this a control frame? Or is it a data frame? Right? So there's, there's that initial flag that says, between one device to the other, what type of information is contained within this frame. Then there is something called the duration or connection ID. And that tells you, um, you know, the time in seconds, okay, microseconds, that the frame will be allocated uh, in order to say, this is successfully transmitted. Now, then there's also a variety of addresses so let's say there are four, okay, one, two, three, four, that represent things like you have the source and destination, right, the transmitting station and the receiving station, okay. Then finally you have the sequence control number. This is actually kind of important, okay. So let's, let's roll back a little bit and think about, you know, the internet, right, and transmitting packets. So what's interesting about the internet is that it's a best effort type of network. Right? So if I transmit something, my packet, my frame goes out there, but what's the guarantee that it gets there in the sequence that I sent it at? So let's say I send out frame 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, right? And it goes there, it gets routed, and then it arrives 1, 4, 3, 2, blah, 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 blah. It, it actually may not arrive in the sequence in which I transmitted it. What this guy does, okay, or even worse yet, um, you know, now that I think about it, what happens if the frame gets corrupted? So we have several situations where we may not receive what we transmitted in order. So what happens is we need something that says, this is the sequence that we got it in. We might buffer a frame and say, OK, we'll wait for everything else to come together so we can stitch it in the right order. Or worse comes to worse, we got a little, little vacant spot there. We then have the frame body. That is whatever the payload is, depending on what type of frame we're dealing with, right? So how would this look like? Okay, so your book has a great diagram. I'm going to, like, you know, sort of sketch it out and, again, sort of articulate some of these finer points, okay? You. There we go. So let's say this is our frame. Okay. So the first one is frame control. Again, this could either be data, control itself, like this has control information, or management. Okay? Following that, we have the duration, okay? Or connection ID. Then after that, we're going to have a series of information, right? We're going to have, like, let's say address 1. Address 2, address 3, we might have the sequence number, and we may have address 4. So what these correspond to, okay, these guys, correspond to the source, destination, transmitting device, and receiving device. And on top of that, the sequence number tells us the ordering of these frames. Because what happens is, suppose it's a data frame. So here's an aside. So, bef well, before I get to that, because I might need to erase this, 
You might have a few other things like quality of service control. We might have, um, you know, some high, and this is my shorthand, throughput control. So if a bit more control information. Our payload is here, right? So that's our data, our frame body, if you will. And then there's a frame check. So that just sees if the frame got corrupted or whatnot. Check control. But let's, let's go back to the sequence number. Why are we concerned about this? Because suppose we have a bunch of information. Okay? So we call this info. Okay? And we want to send this info across the network, right? So this is an aside. So let's put this as an aside. So aside. And so what happens is let's say this big batch of info is just too large to be accommodated by a single frame. So what do you do? What you do is you divide it up okay, into these portions. So let's say that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. You would then, okay, so this would be your header, header. You would essentially have this guy. You would have your header information, right? You would have one, that, that would be all the data here. You would then have your little frame check thing at the end. Two would again be a header. It would be the information from two, this info, and you would have your frame check at the end. Three, header the data, and then the frame check, and you get, you, get, um, you get the picture, right? So every time, like let's say I have this big swath of information, what would I do with it? I've got to carve it up, make it fit into a frame, send it over the internet. And remember, this is, this is a frame. So there's like what's above the Mac layer? Well, we have you know, the network layer, so we have like that IP datagram. Then it's, so that's actually, so our info might be a bunch of datagrams, and then we carve it up, we put it into a frame, and then send that over the air, right? Or across the network. But what ends up happening is you already see a few interesting trade-offs that kick in here. So on the one hand, notice that the payload is not very large. So imagine if you guys become a standardization committee. It's possible, right? You get, you get uh, hired by the right company, and you do well, you make some advances in wireless communications and networking, and what happens? Your boss like saying, okay, you're totally going to be our company's representative for this next generation communication standard, right? Which is pretty cool, and you get to do a lot of traveling. You know, every month you're in a different city. Beijing, Buenos Aires, um, you know, Washington, D.C. So, you know, these standards committees and all these other company folks all meet up and stuff. And you make big decisions that ultimately these companies will have to abide to more or less for their product. What happens is suppose you have the control to design this frame structure yourself. So what's the trade-off? So what happens is, I mentioned it before, so there's a reason why we have a sequence number. So what happens if bad stuff happens to frame, the, the frame that contains the second portion of information? It is lost forever. Correct? Right? So what happens is, on the one hand, we might want to keep everything very, very tiny. Right? We might want to break up that info, because then what happens if we take the hit? If our out of all the information, we just lose one or two portions, very small portions of it. I can reconstruct the rest, right? I can fill in the gap. If, if I have some sort of coding scheme, I can sort of reconstruct that missing information. Perfect. You never know that you actually lost information. What's the bad thing? This, as much as it does a very productive and important role in our communication system, the header is what we call, is called, or another name for it. This guy 
is what we call like overhead. Okay, yeah, header, overhead. But what, what does that mean? It means it's, it's sort of like information on top of the useful stuff that you want to get from your transmission, right? So is the header useful for us? Well, not directly, no. So if I transmit something, do you care about getting the header? Absolutely not. You want that YouTube video. You don't want to know, oh, here's the header, 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 header. We throw that away. It has one purpose, which is to get the information reliably across. So on the one hand, we would love to have very small segments of data such that if they're dinged along the way, and that happens, that we do not at all, like, you know, does not affect us too badly. On the other hand, if we transmit very small portions of the information and the ratio between, let's say, the frame body, so this is frame body, to the header, if the percentage of the overall frame with respect to the frame body begins to decrease, like the header is becoming more dom like you know, becoming a dominant portion of your entire frame, there's a problem. We call this good put, right? Like the, uh, the percentage of the frame that is frame body, the useful information. We usually want this to be 100% of the frame, but ideal, that's ideal, reality, no. We have to put in some information to protect the data there, right? Like the sequence number, like uh, all these other bits, like, you know, where is it going to, where is it coming from, what is the address of the device that's going to, what is the address of the device that's coming from, um, the sequence, the control information for quality of service, for high throughput, all that stuff is necessary, right? So on the one hand, we do not want that to dominate the frame, but at the same time, we don't want all our eggs in one basket. Because imagine I send one massive frame, boom, it dies. What ends up happening? I have to retransmit. It's as good as wasted throughput that way too. So there's that delicate trade-off. So that is what our, like, you know, our frame structure looks like in an 802.11 stru uh, frame, frame structure, okay? Now, going back to our slides, there are, like, so I talked about frame control, right? The, the first bit of information. So there are a variety. So, so there is something called control frames, data frames, and management frames, okay? So there are three types. And then each one of those types have its own sort of subtypes below it. Oh, my God. Let's watch paint dry. Whoo! <laughs> no, just kidding. No, well, it's, kind of, it's almost as boring, but, but what happens is you should be aware that there are several types of frames that are used in 802.11. Like for the first, first instance, like let's say control frames, there's something called a power save pull control frame. What does that do? Anyone? No one. Maybe prince, uh, Princessa. You're kind of like, no, just kidding. Teasing, I am just don't want to pick on people. So what happens is, suppose your device is in power save mode, right? So what happens is, so what does, what's polling? What happens when you poll someone? Let's say in the real world, you poll. So what happens is, like, the control frame does a, like, you know, does a variety of things. So if your device is in power save mode, right, it's like, hey, hey, I want to transmit, you know, so your control frame would be used in that con condition to say, Time to get out of power save mode. I, I have data to send to you. Request to, request to send. It's like, hey, yo, I want to transmit to you. What will happen? Um, you know, there's also clear to send. Yes, I am available. I'm, I'm like, you know, ready to, to receive your, your signal. Then let's say you send your data and you say, do you acknowledge? And then there's a few other things, like contention free, and which means that there's a contention free period in your transmission. So you're not in, in competition with anyone else during that, fr that time period. So you say at the end, oh, this is the end of the contention-free period. And then there's also um, contention-free acknowledgement. Right? So what the control frame does, it handles all sort of the messaging between the transmitting and the receiving 802.11 device. Right? So like all the standard stuff, like are you, like, I, I'm, I'm, I want to transmit to you. Okay, 
Everything's clear. Please proceed with transmitting. Did you get my message? Yes, I did. Acknowledge. Like all that sort of process, right? The data frame, as the name implies, is you're transmitting data. But there's two types. There's data carrying, and then there's also non-data carrying, which we'll get to in a sec. So data carrying, there are four subtypes of data, um, data carrying. So there's just data, there's data, and then there's contention-free acknowledge. There's data, um, con uh, contention-free polling, like, you know, is, is like, uh, with respect to the time period. There's also data, contention-free acknowledge, and contention-free polling. And then with the non-data carrying, it carries actually no data. There's null data in that situation. And then last, but the, uh, which is the management frames, uh, this, is, this deals mostly with association, disassociation, authentication, and uh, beacon and probe frames. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, management frames in a little bit, um, but let's, let's focus on a little bit on the, uh, the, the first two. Okay. Actually, no. Let's, so association, disassociation. So we talked about this yesterday. So let's recap what we talked about yesterday. OK. So what we had, we had this cloud. And remember, that's our distribution system, right? We had these interfaces. So we had station 1, station 2, station 3. <laughs> Right? Station 4, Station 5, st 5, Station 6, right? And this formed our basic service set. That's our local area network, right? A uh, uh, wireless network, sorry. To this, this guy here. And then this is our other basic service set. And this here is essentially how we access, let's say, the distribution system. And this entire, so this is how we connect two basic service sets. And then this guy connects with the internet, of course. And this overall structure here is what we call an extended service set, ESS. So remember, so what we end up having is Let's say you have, like, this would be like one of your wireless switches, right? And it services these stations. So STA means station, right? It's your wireless device. It could also be your, your access point. And then DS is distribution system. System, OK? And that we can connect multiple BSSs through this distribution system to form this ESS, which is still connected, let's say, to the internet. Internet, through this guy here. So, so what happens is we have these multiple access points. So this is essentially our access point, access point. OK. And so what ends up happening now is, OK, how do we do association, disassociation? So how do we choose? to associate with one of these access points and not another one, right? So how do we do that? Let's keep that this time. Okay. So what happens is this, uh, so the distribution system requires information about the stations within the ESS. So a station could be the access points connected to the distribution system, and it could also be the, um, uh, the, the actual individual devices that connect to the access points. And so what happens is we have to have all these guys associated with one of these access points. So, so for instance, if you have mobility, so I'm not sure where uh, Thomas was, but he mentioned, and I think most of you probably have this experience, if you have your smartphone, you're connected to WPI Wi-Fi, and then you go from this building to, let's say, Fuller Labs, or to the campus center, or any one of those places, like you might have great connectivity and seamlessly transition from one BSS, which would be this guy here, this access point, to a BSS on the um, whatever um, basement cafeteria area, right? And so what ends up happening is um, 
I would say that mobility might not be the best description of, like, let's say if you have your smartphone or laptop, I would call it more nomadic, right? You pick up your laptop, you go over here, you put it down, right? Mobility, usually people, when they think of mobility, they think of cars or buses or airplanes. Nomadic sounds more like, you know, after you sit in this lecture hall, you might go to another lecture hall and you're not moving again. And another place, and another place. Nevertheless, there are three different types. You have um, no transition whatsoever. So you're, you, you know, like, let's say you're here for 50 minutes. Well, let's say you're here for 50 minutes and you have your laptops open. What ends up happening is there is no mobility. There is no nomadic behavior that you have within the network. You basically are here, you're connected to that guy, to, and so you're part of the same BSS, you're not moving out of this region. The second type is when you do a BSS transition. You stay part of the WPI network, which is an ESS, right? The extended service set, so every access point on this campus theoretically <coughs> belongs to WPI, right? Unless, unless you have like some pirate Wi-Fi access point, which you should not have. I think, I think something like NetOps will not be happy. So anyways, so what ends up happening is you might go from this lecture hall to 233 across the building to the campus center and whatnot, which means that you're changing BSSs, but you're still part of the ESS, right? Now thirdly, suppose you do an ESS transition. So I, let's say I turn, like, let's say I have my phone on, it's always on Wi-Fi, I always keep the data plan off so I don't connect to the LTE data, and then I go home. Completely different ESS, right? So that's the third type of mobility transition, okay? So what happens is your DS, your distribution system, needs to identify sort of these, uh, the, the identity of these destination stations, right? So they, there must always be an association between an access point and um, within the current BSS. So right now, like you take my phone, my fancy smancy phone, or any of your fancy smancy phones, and right now we have Wi-Fi, and if you set it up correctly, it will say, I'm, a, I'm associated with that guy over here, right? And it authenticates through Mac verification, right? You enter your password, boom, you should have absolutely no problem, theoretically, right? And so what happens is when I go home, exact same thing. Mac verification, there's probably a password. Boom, now I'm associated with that ESS, with that BSS. My, my home situation actually, the BSS and the ESS are one and the same, right? So what happens is we call this association. I'm associating with this BSS, with this access point in this BSS. And so when that's what, when we make that, like, you know, between station and AP, reassociations when I go to 233 with this device or my office, totally different BSS. I'm uh, sorry, yeah, different BSS. And this association is when I leave campus, I'm driving up Route 12, and I go on 190, I'm pretty far away from WPI Wi Fi at that point, and my phone loses all connection with WPI disassociates, right? So no surprises there. There is also the authentication, the authentication and privacy side of the house, right? So the authentication is, who are you? So I already mentioned it, right? So every, okay, so I'm assuming everybody, I'm not even going to ask for a raise of hands. Um, but everybody here probably has a Wi-Fi device. Everybody probably connects to WPI Wi-Fi, right? Anybody who doesn't? Anybody fed up and swears they'll never connect to WPI Wi-Fi? No. Okay, good, good, good. Sort of? Just, just out of spite? <laughs> ah, okay, okay. No, the, you know, there are some, sometimes, like, you know, WPI does something, and I'm like, never. Like, for instance, when, um, I'm not sure if any of you remember this. Oh, I'm not sure. Like, so employees, usually we get this little parking thing. We stick it on our windshields and stuff, and we don't get a ticket. One year, what happens is they said, because some professors decide to park, and they get a ticket, and they say, what are you going to do? Hold back my transcripts? So what happens is, so this is a small aside. So what happens is one year um, they said, okay, if you're going to get a parking decal, you have to sign here. It's like, what am, what am I signing? Oh, in case you get a ticket and you don't pay it, we automatically deduct it from your paycheck. And it's like, and oh, yeah, and the professors were like, oh. yeah. So anyway, so I refused for about half a year to get WPI parking sticker out of principle. So anyways, <laughs> it seems like everybody here connects to WPI Wi-Fi. That's great. 
So what do you do? You give CCC your MAC address, and you have to have a valid WPI username and password, correct? So that's how it says, like, I know that you guys are who you say you are and your device is legit, right? And, and of course, when you look at the, um, what is it, uh, uh, user whatever, like EULP, -E whatever, like a, a sense, a end user agreement, um, that it says that, you know, you're responsible for your account. So let's say you give it to a friend and, you know, friend starts downloading movies and stuff, you're responsible for that, right? So don't, don't have your friends download movies. Anyways, so authentication uh, you know, verifies who you are before you connect to the network. And then the deauthentication is when you are, or have an existing authentication and you terminate that authentication. Privacy um, is also very important because what you want is, and again, I love this, I love this, is wireless is not secure. You know, like you can encrypt your information and stuff, so, you know, people talk about encryption all the time. You probably have taken one of the undergrad courses in encryption uh, and security and such. But for the most part, when you are doing wireless, you're, you're just broadcasting, your, you know, you're, you're blasting away electromagnetic energy, and people can hear it, right? And sure, maybe your data is encrypted and it's very strong and stuff, but that's one form of information that maybe a potential hacker does not know but there's a lot of other information, right? Like for instance, um, you know, the header. That MAC header thing that I drew, let's go over to this guy. Oh no, I already deleted, oh boo-hoo. What happens is that MAC header is not encrypted. No one knows, like you know, what happens is the payload will be encrypted, but the MAC, no. You, you know, so what happens is if you ask your TA Le Wong, like, hey Le, um, can you do some packet sniffing out there and, and uh, out over the air and see who's transmitting what? It's like, oh yeah, here's this device, this wireless device that's trying to connect to that access point over there. Can't see the information, totally can see who's the source, who's the destination. Oh, this is a sequence number. There's a lot of information buried in it. Some folks, again, Liz's master's thesis when he did his master's with me was, where is this Wi-Fi access point transmitting from? So we, we, we use the Wi-Fi signal. Let's say it could also be applied to your laptop or your smartphone. We can triangulate your location in a building. So we know your location. Ooh, this sounds scary, right? So, so what happens is, like, there is very serious privacy concerns. Suppose, like, let's say, for instance, this is the one thing that really scares me, is, like, for instance, um, like you have your smartphone, you're connected to your 4G LTE data, right? And uh, what happens is, I'm just waiting for the day, like what's inside these beautiful shiny devices? Hmm? Yes, capacitors. But how are they arranged? What, like what's one particular feature of this? Well, well close. So, uh, the, the, there, you know, there's, um, you know, there's, you know, there's hardware in here that can tell you about your orientation of your device. Um, it, it can be used in, or in mapping, right? So there's some sort of uh, IMU, an inertial uh, a measurement unit inside, right? So it knows what the orientation is. I do this, like if I shake my phone now, maybe in the right way, I don't know. Um, but what happens is this device and all your devices <coughs> gives a lot of information about the physical world around you. Imagine if someone creates an app, or there's already an app, where you're in your car, and let's say you're going a little bit over the speed limit, it gives someone the location of where you are, it gives someone the approximate speed, so let's say it's 80 miles per hour, but you're in a 40 miles per hour zone, right? So what happens is your privacy is being compromised. Worse yet, imagine if your insurance company finds out. Not so good, yes? The only thing, so, so that's a great point about Google, Google Maps and stuff, and if we agree to it. How many people here read the fine print when you click accept? Anyone? I think there was a South Park episode about that, right? So, yes. I, 
I, I very fondly remember that episode. But that's exactly, that's the thing. And I do, I'm aware of some, there's a professor I know at MIT, and he's working with insurance companies to create an app. Just like a few years ago, you had, I forgot which insurance company, and you would just plug it into your OBD2 port, and essentially get lower insurance rates if you're a safe driver. What happens is, what my concern is, the future, you might not have an option not to put something on your phone and keep track of your movements and stuff. So privacy is, is a big concern, but that's a great point. So going back to privacy, Wi-Fi does its best in order to encrypt at least the payload data. So if you're streaming YouTube videos of cats and stuff, no one should know about it, right? So ideally. And so there are a variety of different security features from WEP, which is kind of weak, to WPA and WPA2, which is a little bit stronger. All right, so now let's look at Mac. And so in particular, I want to jump to, you know, there are a variety of things, but the one thing I want to talk about is this, okay? So I'm going to skip ahead, but I really want to talk about CSMA CD and CSMA CA, okay? So what is the difference between these two? They're obviously, what is it? Um, carrier sense multiple access, both of them, check out the channel, right? They say, hey, is this in use or not, right? And it's multiple access, which means that it facilitates multiple people sharing the same wireless channel. So going back to that lovely diagram, oh, come on. Boop, boop, boop. So we saw this, especially on, I forgot which quiz it was. User one, user two, user three, right? And this is channel one. So what ends up happening is, and this is time, okay? So let's say this is the intention of these guys, of these three users that want to access the channel. So this is information that's being wanting to be sent to channel one. There are all these three, just to, to reiterate, want to share channel one. So channel one is a shared resource amongst these three users. So user one transmits. Nobody else is located at that time instant and gets his information across. User two then transmits. No one's transmitting at that time, so he gets to transmit across that channel. But user 1 and 2 come in conflict over here. So we saw with CSMA CD, what happens? So in, in CSMA CD, user 2 transmits, user 1 observes and says, whoa, okay, I can't transmit there. Um, uh, you know, based on my observation of the channel, it seems like it's already occupied. I'm going to back off and transmit here instead. And sure enough, he's good and he gets to transmit. So here we avoid collision by monitoring channel. Okay? So here it's, it's, it's I would like to say it's passive, right? I would like to say that, like, you know, each device is sort of like listening to the channel. Oh, is it not occupied? Okay, I'm going to go in, right? So it's, it's, so, in very, in, it's, so in many ways, it's sort of like the look before you leap, and nobody really declares their intention. And if someone's already there, okay, I'm, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait a minute and, and let that guy transmit. And then we see the same thing with user three. There's another conflict here. So this guy, because he came first, transmits. This guy, unfortunately, again, backs off a little bit in time, transmits there, and then lastly, this guy transmits. So this is CSMA CD. So it's relatively passive. It's a look before you leap strategy. So it avoids collision. CSMA CA, on the other hand, is a little bit different. Okay. So this is collision detection. 
the, I wish I can spell detection. This guy here is collision avoidance. And you might say, OK, well, what's the difference? They both sound the same. What? Ugh. So what happens is CSMACA is a little bit different. What CSMACA does um, is that it's primarily used for like wireless communication. So wired communications, uh, CSMA CD is great. It just looks to see if anyone's on the line or the fiber and stuff. Oh, it's all clear? OK, I'm going to transmit. Um, and, and still, there is a possibility that you might have a collision. If, let's say, you start transmitting and someone else is already there, oh, 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 oh really, sorry, I'm going to back off. And then I'm going to transmit a little bit uh, a while later. Because let's say your information's not up to date. There is a little bit of latency. What CSMACA does is, OK, the channel's clear. I'm going to announce my intention to transmit. Everyone else back off. So it's a little bit of a different mindset. So you see the channel's available. OK, the channel's available. I'm going to announce my intention to transmit on the channel. Nobody else transmit. OK, go ahead and transmit. There's contention free, right? No one else is going to compete with you. Now I'm done. OK, next transmission. That's how CSMA CA operates, OK? So it's a little bit different than CD. And it works nicely in a wireless environment because of all the different players. And we talked about things like the hidden node problem and stuff. So this way, what happens is we, we kind of we, we, we become more proactive in terms of our intention to access a shared resource. Okay. And I mentioned this already, hidden node. And we didn't talk about this guy so much, the exposed station problem. Okay. So the hidden node or hidden terminal problem, especially in a wireless environment, is, a, is problematic. Because in a wired environment, okay. in a wired environment, what we have is everyone's connected through this. Um, well, let me let me go back to draw. Oh, whenever I whenever it gets complicated, I'm just going to draw. So in a wired environment, it's great because we have copper or fiber, coax, Ethernet, you name it, and you have terminal, 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 right? And so if someone's operating across the shared medium, so in this case, the shared medium is wired. Wire. What happens? So this guy transmits a certain power. It goes over the line. Let's say it goes to whatever server is over here. And then these guys listen. Okay. This guy and this guy, and can sense, OK, this, this medium is being used or being occupied. What happens is, in a wired medium, there's, there's still some non-idealities. Okay? But for the most part, um, if you hear someone transmit, or someone's in receive mode, there, it's a little bit easier to sort of monitor the medium as opposed to a wireless medium. Wireless, that's one of the big issues with the wireless medium. It's a lot more complicated than a wired medium. Okay. Like, there's still some difficulties. Like, for instance, like, I'm not sure. Um, I don't think 2112 or 3113 talks about this. Um, any course here teach about, like, transmission line theory, like impedance matching and Smith charts? Wh which one's that? 2112 does. Oh, it does. Okay. Because it, that's usually not a fields thing, but okay. So, yeah, so what happens is, like, if you have these guys and their transmission lines, and you send signals down them. And if they're not properly matched, you get reflections, you get this bad stuff. And it actually doesn't make for a great environment. But for the most part, we could consider this mostly ideal. It's a nice, great way to transmit information. On the other hand, in a wireless environment, and this is what keeps those paychecks coming, what ends up happening is in a wireless environment, you have a lot more different features. Like, let's say between these two, these two nodes, node 1 and node 2, let's say you have a big mountain. Okay? And what happens is they don't hear each other, but they both want to transmit to this guy. Right? So what ends up happening is they both transmit. This guy gets essentially um, jammed. 
there's interference because suppose he wants to listen to node 2, but node 1 does not know that node 2 is transmitting, and it blasts away, right? Worse yet, and this is a much more common occurrence, you have a huge TV tower, okay? And then you have, let's say, 45 miles away, you have my TV antenna, right, and my TV set. And then, suppose there's somebody else near me, right? So let's say a mile away. One of my neighbors, say. One mile. And they have what they call a TV white space device. So what is a TVWS device? It is like, so recently, the FCC is allowing people to use TV spectrum, TV channels, for purposes other than TV broadcasts. So what ends up happening is somebody is using a TV white space device, let's say some sort of Wi-Fi, but in TV white space, and that's allowed. Which standard? 802.11, uh, not sure if it's G. G, G is sensor net, no, it's H, um, F. I think it's AF, yes. So what happens is somebody's next to me and they start jamming me, right? Can my TV talk back? No, not at all. So what happens is hidden node. And that's the problem with a lot of these studies. What happens is when people say, oh, we can use TV spectrum, it'll be great. It won't interfere with anyone. Can you check that? N not at your own TV set, because these guys are not, the only way you can report a problem is you call your TV station and say, hey, I can't hear anything, I have interference, or the FCC. But uh, as a network, your TV is in receive only, RX only. OK. Anyways. So what happens is in the hidden node problem, the situation is you have a wireless station. OK, you have wireless stations that are within transmission ranges, and, but, not, but they may not be it within radio range of each other. So it's like I have two stations here. They want to talk to me. They can't hear each other, but I can hear both of them. And they're going blah, 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 blah. That's a problem. What happens is they can't hear each other. I hear both of them in stereo, and I'm not able to separate the two signals out. I'm getting interfered. I'm getting bombarded by two sets of signals, right? So in this case, CSMA won't work, right? So that's a problem with Wi-Fi. So let's say there's an access point, and 100 meters away, I have one laptop. In the opposite direction from that access point, there's another laptop. They can't do CSMA-CA, right? They can't say, oh, you're using the channel. I can't transmit. They can't hear if they're using the channel. Because at 200 meters away, they're outside the theoretical limits, the bounds for transmission distance, right? Again, hand waving. I should be using diagrams. <sighs> Sorry about that, folks. So what ends up happening? So CSMACA. So here's access point AP. It looks like a triangle, but no, it's actually an access point. Here's one Wi-Fi device. This is your other Wi-Fi device, station. That is station one. That is station two. So they do CSMACA, and then they start transmitting. And the problem is, this guy cannot hear sta two. This guy cannot hear sta one. So CSMA fails because they can't back off. They can't say, oh, 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 pardon me. I did not know you were using this channel. They don't know. So they're jamming, essentially, the access point. <laughs> so, so what ends up happening is then we have the other case of the exposed station problem, okay? which is the total opposite to the hidden node problem. Okay? So everything's in range of each other. And and again, and so, see, and so that, that too is, can be problematic. OK, so just wrapping up. So we have this return to send and clear to send 
So our control, we saw this before with respect to the frame control. So we have this, um, th this mechanism that says, I, are you ready to, uh, you know, RTF and CTF? So request to send. Can I, can I send data to you? Yes, you are all clear to send data to me, right? And so what happens is when you go through this process, RTS, CTS, transmitted, acknowledge, thank you. Yeah, I, I know, you don't need to have a monotone computerized voice, but for effect, I'm going to use it anyway. So you use RTS, CTS, you send your data, and then it's like, ack, you know? So what happens is the RTS is when you alert all stations within range of the source that the exchange is underway. So what happens is this is your way of saying, yo, I'm ready to send. Like once you see that the channel's clear, that's your cue saying, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send out if no one else is sending. <coughs> and then the CTS alerts all stations also within range. So all this dialogue is happening in open air, right? So the CTS, the RTS, everyone hears this because they need to know that this medium is about to be accessed for wireless data transmission, okay? And then these stations don't transmit to avoid any nasty collision stuff, right? Okay, and then there's these, these funny things called uh, um, uh, IFSs, okay? So what happens is there's, um, there's short IFS, there's a point coordination function IFS, and there's distributed coordination function IFS. So these types of messages, okay? So what we're doing is we're classifying different types of actions, okay? Um, or messages in this network, like the short IFSs. What they do is these require immediate responses. So this is high priority. This is the highest priority. They're very short, and they're like things like, for instance, in the ACTS, the CTSs, and the poll responses. The point coordination functions, what they do, okay, is that they centralize the controller in the PCF team when issuing those polls, right? So it's more important than normal traffic, but it's not like an ACT. Okay, or a CTS or any of those guys. And then last but not least, you have the distributed coordination function. And so what this guy is used for is for the minimum delay of asynchronous frames that are contending for access of this environment. <coughs> so what happens is these, these values, if you will, uh, these messages, they each have a different priority with the highest one being the SIFs and the PIFs and the DIFs. What they are for are like lower priority than the SIFs but they're more important than just, say, regular messaging in the network, okay? Okay, so with that, uh, that concludes uh, lecture 18. All right.